When I took apart the old broken iPad 1, I ended up with a nice LCD screen for my magic mirror, and I also ended up with a couple of speakers. I want to complete the salvage operation and turn these two speakers into something useful. For most of my audio projects, I've been using the Max 98357 breakout board from Adafruit. This is a great little I2S Class D amplifier, however, it only supports one channel, so if you want to have stereo output, you need two boards. This is fine, but it's a bit of a faff wiring it all up. It's not a massive hardship, but let's make our lives slightly easier. But first, I'd like to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this video. PCBWay offer PCB production, CNC and 3D printing, PCB assembly, and much, much more. They're great to deal with and offer excellent quality, service, and value for money. Check out the link in the description. So, looking at the Adafruit board, I think there's room for two ICs, and the nice thing about I2S is that it's designed for stereo signals, so we won't need any extra pins. This should mean that whatever we design can be made to be pin compatible with the Adafruit boards. If we look at the datasheet, we can see it's actually a very simple IC to wire up. We just need a couple of bypass capacitors for each IC, and we need a resistor on one of the ICs so that it knows it's on the right stereo channel. We can also take a look at the Adafruit schematic to see what they've done. Interestingly, they've added an additional LC filter to the output. Checking with some other breakout boards, we can see that they omit the LC filter. And looking in the datasheet, we can see that this should be optional. So to save a few components, I'll omit them from my design and rely on the speakers acting as a low pass filter. Let's jump into Easy EDA and create our schematic. We'll start off with a 7 pin header and make sure we match the Adafruit board exactly. We need VCC, ground, shutdown, gain, data in, B clock, and LR clock. With the header in place, we can now wire up our first IC for the left channel. We'll pull in the IC and hook up the pins. It's not a difficult schematic to wire up. For the not connected pins on the IC, I'm going to connect them all to ground. This should help with thermal dissipation as I'm planning on making quite a large ground plane. With the power and ground connections done, we can just hook up the nets for the signal lines. And then we hook up the positive and negative outputs to the speaker. To save some space, I'm going to use some quite small screw headers with a pitch of 0.1 of an inch. The last thing we need are the 2D coupling capacitors. And that's our left channel completed. As I said before, it really is a simple schematic. We'll just make a copy of this for the right channel. The only real difference between the left and right schematic is that we have a resistor that we need to place in series with the SD input. Let's have a look at the datasheet to see how to calculate the value for this. I'm using the approach given in figure 5, so we'll need to pick a value for R that gives us a voltage between 0.77 volts and 1.4 volts when the GPIO is outputting 3.3 volts. There's an internal pull down resistor of 100 kilo ohms with a tolerance of plus or minus 8%. So I've calculated that a 200 kilo ohm resistor with a 1% tolerance should work for us. In the worst case scenario, where we have 202 kilo ohms for R and 92 kilo ohms for the internal pull down resistor, we'll have a voltage of just over 1 volt. And in the other worst case, where we have 198 kilo ohms for R, and 108 kilo ohms for the internal pull down resistor will have a voltage of around 1.16 volts. This puts us pretty much in the middle of the voltage range of 0.77 volts to 1.4 volts for right channel mode. We'll add this resistor into the schematic for our right channel and feed the SD signal through it. Now we just need to make sure our output is properly wired up and we're done with the right channel. As I've said before, this is a really nice and simple schematic to wire up. We're now ready to do the PCB layout. I'll start off with a rough layout of where the components should go, placing them in approximately the right locations and orienting them so the pins and the signals are nicely lined up. Since this is a breakout board, labelling is pretty important, so I'll also do that now to make sure the text fits in nicely. I'll neaten up the layout slightly, and once we've got everything in roughly the correct positions, we can add the board outline along with some mounting holes. I'm also going to copy the pin labels to the bottom of the board. This is really handy, and I wish more dev boards would do this. The last thing we'll do before starting the wiring up is label the output pins. Once again, I'll duplicate these on the bottom of the board as well. We're now ready to start wiring things up. I'll turn off the silk layers for this stage as they are getting in the way. I'll start off with the signal wires. We'll do the left channel first, 
I've turned off the VCC and ground nets to make it slightly easier to see what I'm doing. For the right channel, I don't think there's any choice but to use the bottom of the board for some of the traces. I'm just going to tweak some of the positions to make sure the silk screen is still readable and adjust some of the wires. For the power, I'm going to use quite thick traces. The amplifiers can draw a fair amount of current when the gain is set to maximum. I'm going to use 40 millibit traces, which should be more than sufficient. To get the power to the left channel, I'll use a thick trace on the bottom of the board. I'll also use thick traces for most of the wires to the speaker output. I can't use thick traces all the way as the pins are too close together. We'll add copper pores to the top and bottom of the board for a ground and stitch them together with vias. The thermal pads on the ICs are connected to these ground planes, so this will provide a nice route for any heat to escape. After looking at the ground plane on the bottom layer, I've decided to reroute the signal traces for the right channel so we get a better ground plane under the left IC. And with that done, I'll redo the copper areas and we're pretty much done. Just some final tweaks on the silk screen layer to tidy things up, and we need to add a label to the board with a revision number. So that's it, all done. I've exported the Gerber file and we can jump onto PCBWay to get the board ordered. We'll use the PCB instant quote option and upload our Gerber file. Everything should be set up for us. I'm going to get these boards SMT assembled so we'll complete the SMT assembly section and proceed to our shopping cart. Here we upload the bomb file and the pick and place file which we can export using the fabrication menu in Easy EDA. PCB Way will now source our components and give us a complete cost for our five boards. One of the nice things with PCB Way is that you have a lot of options when it comes to components. You're not limited to a restricted parts library. They will source the components for you and you can even supply your own components if you want to. Within a day we have an email from PCB Way with the cost for our parts. Once we've approved the cost the order goes into production and we can track the progress online. Now if you've watched the most recent mailbag video you'll know the boards have arrived. They look really good. I've soldered one of them up and we're ready to test. I've got a couple of speakers that I salvaged from my old iPad 1 which I took apart for the Magic Mirror project. I'm also using version 2 of my audio PCB, so this is a double test. Let's hope I've got the wiring set up properly. It works really nicely. The bare speakers don't sound great, so I thought I'd try 3D printing some speaker enclosures. Turns out I don't know anything about designing speakers, and it sounds pretty much the same as before. On the boards there are a couple of things I'd like to improve. I was a bit aggressive in making the boards as small as possible, and the screw terminals are hanging off the edge of the board. They're also pretty close to the amplifier chips, and they only just fit in this space. You also can't see the labels for the screw terminals. They are visible on the bottom of the board, but that's not much use when the board is plugged into breadboard. I'll fix these issues and I'll publish version 2 on PCBWay for other people to order. So now we've got a stereo amplifier and some speakers. What can we do with them? I'm going to make a really simple Bluetooth speaker. The ESP32 supports Bluetooth A to DP, which makes this very easy. There's also a really nice library from P. Schatzman on GitHub that makes this a breeze. All we need to do is tell it the I2S configuration and the pins to use, and it will do all the heavy lifting. Once it's up and running, we can pair with our new audio device and start playing sound. It's pretty cool. I'm really happy with both my speaker salvage and my new audio boards. Hope you enjoyed watching the process. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.